It is good to be in God's house this morning. As you see, we are an intimate crowd today. Um, oops, switch. There's an intimate crowd today. Uh, there's a conference going on, so a lot of the members of the church went uh, to this conference. And there's also no second service. So I can preach for like two or three hours, right? Um, uh, I'm not going to, trust me. Uh, I just want to thank... Uh, pastors for just giving me this opportunity to share from the word. Um, the theme or the series that we've, we're in right now is Freedom Song. And when Pastor C had asked uh, me to, to speak this particular Sunday and then said this was the theme, I was, uh, he had a, a guideline kind of the direction that he wanted for this series. And anytime uh, I'm asked to speak, I always, you know, either I get a word and God always changes it. And um, so the word that I got, uh, the title is, The Struggle is Real. Um, and if you look at, like, times nowadays, it's this whole, like, fad of hashtags and all of that. And a hashtag is used in social media where uh, it's a phrase um, preceded by a hash or the number sign, and it's used to identify messages on a specific topic. So I actually Googled, and I typed in, The Struggle is Real, and I saw some of the things that came up. And... The concept of struggle is real is, is an expression used to emphasize the gravity of, frus of a frustrating circumstance or hardship. So, so when you look at a social media perspective, it's mostly like something that's really absurd. Like it's really not a struggle, but, you know, so some of the examples that came up were um, when you want Starbucks, but you only have $3, the struggle is real. Uh, trying to fall asleep, but you can't, but you have to because you got to get up early tomorrow, the struggle is real. Um, the time you watched eight seasons of a show in two weeks, and now you have to wait until September for new episodes. The struggle is real. And for my women, the, whim the moment you put on mascara and you sneeze, the struggle is real. Um, so with that being said, uh, the passage that I felt like the Lord was directing me towards was uh, 1 Samuel 16. And uh, it's a passage that we all are familiar with, especially if you grew up in the church. And it's the story of David and when uh, he becomes anointed as king. So uh, if you turn to 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 1, I'm reading from the New King James Version. Um, it says, Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I'm sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he, he will kill me. But the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Then invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do. You shall anoint for me the one I named to you. So Samuel did what the Lord said and went to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, do you come peaceably? And he said, peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. So it was when they came that he looked at Eliab and said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outer appearance, outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse said, made Shammah made pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are all the young men here? Then he said, There remains yet the youngest, and there he is, keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down till he comes. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. Now, David was not the first king of Israel. Uh, in fact, he wasn't even the one that the people wanted. And if you looked at the, the life and the story of the Israelites, before David, there was a man by the name of Saul who was the first king of Israel. And when Saul was anointed, it was kind of out of 
for the sake of having a king. The Israelites had kind of demanded and demanded, I want a king, we want a king, we want a king. And so God felt kind of rejected and God felt kind of like, you know, the people of Israel do not want me anymore. The people of Israel do not want a connection with me. And at the time, the Israelites were in a state of complete rebellion and complete disobedience. And they were demanding them, demanding of God to provide a king for them. So Saul became king over Israel. And prior to uh, all, prior to Saul, there were judges. And um, one by one, the judges had passed. And when Saul came into power, he started off in the right foot, but he let pride, jealousy, and disobedience be the reason for, be the reason for his destruction and why he no longer became, uh, or why he was rejected to be uh, king. And as we continue further in his story, when we get to 1 Samuel 15, uh, we get to the part where it says that uh, Saul was rejected by God. And this was so because he was disobedient and didn't follow God and, like he should have. So now God turned away from Saul. So when we get to chapter 16, verses 1, we, it's, it says that Samuel was mourning the rejection of Saul as the king. But God was ready to move to the next person, and God was ready to move to the next step. So sometimes when there's things in our lives that we need to let go, if we keep focusing on those things, we will fail to realize that God is ready to move ahead. So God sent Samuel on this mission, and this mission was to anoint the next king of Israel. But in order for this to happen, Samuel was really fearful as far as, you know, what if Saul gets wind of what's happening? What if Saul gets wind of, of what's going on? So God tells Samuel, I want you to uh, uh, set up a church service. I want you to, you know, start a worship service, set up an offering. I want you to get the, the altar ready, get the ushers ready. I want you to make sure that the, the band is ready. I want you to set up a worship service. But in the midst of this worship service, I want you to find a king. And, and, and I want you to, to specifically invite Jesse and his sons because the next king of Israel it was, was within the, the line of Jesse, within one of the sons of Jesse. So now here Jesse is as, as a father. I could imagine um, him telling his sons, okay, the judge, the, the last judge or this, the, the, the prophet of God is coming to our town and we got a special invite to go and worship with this prophet. So you know what? I want you to put your Sunday best on. I want you to make sure you're prim and proper. We are about to go into the house of God. We are about to walk in into, into the house. So make sure you're all ready and, and, and ready to go. And so imagine, you know, the, the sons are ready. The Jesse's ready. The elders are, are there. They're ready. And one by one, there is, you know, I imagine like a runway kind of. Uh, they're, 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 like not that they're modeling, but they're literally walking by. And, and every single one of them was rejected. You know, and, and they, none of them were chosen to be uh, what the, the next king of Israel. And um, where's David in the story? It, D David got an invite too, right? David is one of the sons of Jesse. But the initial invitation, David never got. David wasn't on the A team. He wasn't on the B squad. He wasn't even a thought at the time. And, uh, but David's connection with God was greater in the field than his brothers who were worshiping with the prophet. God was not looking at the sacrifices he was making in the church, but the offerings he was making when he wasn't in the church. So when we are not in the church and when we're not here on a Sunday morning, what is our day-to-day -day looking like? What does our Monday through Saturday look like? It's so great that we can lift our hands on a Sunday morning, but when we are in our cars, are we, are we worshiping God while we're driving our cars? Are we worshiping God while we are, are at our jobs, at our computers? Are we praising the Lord when, when the person in front of us cuts us off? Are we, are we lifting uh, his name on high when, when we're frustrated and when we're angry? Are we, are we using our day-to-day-to-day-to-day -to -day -to -day -to -day lives worshiping God or are we only worshiping God on a Sunday morning or on a Friday night 412 meeting or, or, or on a Saturday night meeting where David was more useful worshiping God in the field than his brothers were worshiping in the house of God. And if you, if you look at uh, uh, David's life, every action that David did was a reflection of what God was doing in his life. For example, when you read Psalms 23, David was known to be a shepherd, right? David was a shepherd. So when he says, the Lord is my shepherd, he knows what the word shepherd means. He knows what it means and what it entails. So when he says, the Lord is my shepherd, he goes, Lord, you are my shepherd because I know that when I'm a shepherd, I, 
uh, I walk my, my sheep along the paths and, and, and I, I, I lay them beside still waters. And as I do that, I know that you do that for me. And when I walk through the valleys of the shadows of death with my sheep, I know you are walking the valleys of the shadows of death with me. So every reflection and every action that David was doing and everything that was a re complete reflection of how he saw his walk with God. And so um, now here David is, he's in the field. And all the sons of Jesse have been rejected. Now Samuel asks, are there any more? And Jesse tells them, yeah, there's the youngest. You know, he's kind of out in the field. You know, he's, 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 he's tending the sheep. And um, so Samuel says, I want you to go get your son. You know, and David walks into the room where everyone was sanctified and everyone has got their Sunday best on. And if you look at David, he doesn't have us. He's coming straight from the field. He's coming straight from, from hanging out with the sheep and straight from hanging out, uh, you know, feeding the sheep in the dirt and, and all of that. And David's probably smelling like dirty animal, and he probably hasn't shaved and has got dirt and feet all over, uh, dirt uh, and mud all over him. And what does the Lord say? It says, anoint him. This is the one. So don't matter what you look like when you come into the church and when you come into the house of God, but you can become you can be as dirty as as filthy rags. But God says, come as you are. I don't care about what you look like. I don't care about how you dress. I don't care what your past is. I don't care what your what you think other people have labeled you as. You might be the youngest. You might be the smallest. You might be a little boy. You might be a little girl. You might be whoever whatever labels are around you and the labels that people have placed over you and it could have been your own parents Jesse didn't even want him in this in this in this moment but David when he walks in dirty and filthy and 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 doing what God has ordained and destined him to do that's when God says anoint him this is the one and and it's amazing because oftentimes we look to get validated by people, right? Guys want to get validated by girls. Girls want to get validated by guys. Kids want to get validated by parents. Church folks want to get validated by their, their pastors and their leaders. But when God validates you, that is the only validation that really matters. And, and what's amazing is David didn't go looking for the anointing. The anointing went after him. And when David was anointed as king, he was probably a teenager and he was probably going through puberty and going through that really awkward phase in life. And uh, now here David is. He's anointed as king. And then what happens next? He walks into the palace and he sits on his throne, right? No. David goes back and he tends to the sheep. He's anointed as king and he's ten he goes back and tends to his sheep. It took David about 15 to 20 years, it says, estimated time to become the king of Israel, to be crowned the king of Israel. He, he, the next years of his life, 15 to 20 years, he went running, running, and running. Saul was out for his head. Saul knew that he was the next king of Israel. Saul was, I mean, uh, David was, was winning favor amongst other leaders. David was winning favor amongst the Israelites. And David was pretty much treated as a fugitive. Saul wanted him dead. The struggle was real. The journey that David was facing for those 15 to 20 years, the struggle was real. David could, let, David could have let the circumstances of his life get in the way of his calling and his purpose. But everything that David did from the moment he was anointed as king to the moment he became king was to prepare him to fulfill his purpose. David knew that what God said about him was greater than what people were saying about him. Although they might have said, Saul killed your thousands and David killed your ten thousands, that didn't matter because this was the one that David had, this is the one that God had chosen. When God calls you into something, there is nothing that will stop God's plan and he will orchestrate every single part of your life to fulfill his plan. And we tend to look at our own lives and we get caught up in and God, why is this happening to me? Have you looked at my bank statement? Do you see how my kids are? Do you see the job that I have? I, I, my, my managers treat me really messed up. My school grades are, are terrible. We look at our lives and we, we just keep throwing these things at God, saying, you know, God, you told me that I was going to graduate college. You told me that I was going to get a job. You told me that I would provide for my family. You told me. And we tend to throw these excuses at God. And if God says, yes, I will take care of it, God's timing is perfect, not ours. And we have to understand 
It's all in the process. And everything that David went through in his life, every single moment, every battle that he fought, every person that he was running from, everything that he said, it was all glory to God. He didn't care. His eyes were fixed on God. His, his motives were fixed on God. Everything that he did was fixed on God. When I was, uh, a lot of you know my story as far as when I was called to go into missions, uh, I was in college, and when I was in college, I knew that I, I, I wanted to do missions, and I knew that God called me into that, and uh, I didn't know what that looked like. I didn't know what, um, you know, what that entails, but I knew that I needed to finish my degree, and I knew that I needed to um, uh, finish where I was at at that moment, and so, um, but the journey to get to, to the mission field was an interesting journey in that being an Indian female, uh, I am not supposed to do missions until like later, later on in life or, you know, after I get married and all of that stuff. So when I felt like God was calling me into missions and calling me into ministry, I didn't know what it looked like and I didn't know how it was going to happen. But I knew without a shadow of a doubt, God was the one that called me. And I knew that no matter what, that no matter who said what, whether it be my parents or whether it be my family or whether it be the church leaders or whatever, I knew without a shadow of a doubt that God was the one that called me and in his time he would make it happen. And it took me graduating college, starting a job, and after starting a job, hearing God's voice saying, it is time, now it's time to go. And even thinking, yes, all right, God, you said it's time to go. Even the battle of, you know, Giving, getting my parents' blessing to take that next step. and But with every single step, God was there. And and the only thing, the only voice that I needed to hear and the only person that I needed to look to at the time was Christ and Christ alone. And it was, it was only by his word and only knowing that he said it and I know that it was going to happen. And sometimes we get in the way of our own selves from letting God move in our life. We make excuses or let the voices of others stop us from moving forward. But if David had listened to the threats of King Saul instead of the voice and the promise of God, he never would have became king. If he had let the calling or the entitlement of knowing he was king get in the way of the promise, then he would have let pride get in the way of fulfilling his promise. God knows exactly what, where you are. And he knows exactly what you're doing. He knows your whole situation. He knows what it is you're facing. He knows he's put you in there. And, and uh, I lead uh, uh, the, the 412 teens group. And I always tell them there is nothing that you could do or you could say to God that would shock God right? That you can be like, God, do you see my circumstance? Do you see, do you see my grades? And he's like, no, I don't see your grades. Oh my God, it's a shock. I can't believe it. That's not how God reacts. He knows exactly what you're going through. He sees exactly what it is that you're facing. And you should know that sometimes we get stuck because we're so caught up in our own self. We're so caught up in our own moments. We're so caught up in excuses that we, we, we fail to move forward in God. Um, I spent almost a year in Guatemala. It was about 10 months when um, it was my longest trip that I went on. My first trip was three months and then came back and I did a, smooth, a few smaller trips. But my big trip was uh, to Guatemala. And I remember I, I, I landed in Guatemala in August. And around November, um, I, I was having like a meltdown. There was one night. And I just, I was feeling lonely. I was feeling homesick. I, for those of you that don't know, I lived at a girl's home. And uh, I, I'm serving at this girl's home, and you're surrounded by like 50, you know, I think it's like 57 little girls between the ages of four and like 20, 21, and, and uh, they're orphaned, they're abandoned, they've been rejected, and, uh, and you're pouring into these girls, and you're pouring into, into that, and I remember one night, it was, it was around the, like Thanksgiving was maybe like a week away, Christmas was coming up, and I just felt this a uh, moment of loneliness, this moment of just, I want to give up. I was tired. I was, I, was, I was just like, I missed home. I was tired of the spiders everywhere. I was just so fed up with what, like, my immediate circumstance. Like, I think, I don't know, there was a spider in my, my bed, and I'm like, I can't take it. Like, I just, it was just, like, days and weeks and weeks and weeks of absolute frustration and just, like, I, and I remember sitting before God, and I'm just like, God, I know you have called me here, and I know that, that it is you that, that's brought me here. So you need to help me get through this because I cannot do this on my own. And I remember uh, having this moment with God where I, I, I was missing home. I, was, I knew Thanksgiving was coming up. I knew the holidays was coming up. I knew my friends were getting together. I knew my family was getting together. And, and I just, I really, truly felt lonely. And I, 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 I felt like, 
you know, I, I just, I was ready to pack my bags. And I knew if I had called home and told my parents, I want to come home, my dad would have booked the first ticket for me out of there. And, and, I, and I knew that I couldn't turn to my earthly dad and I couldn't turn to my earthly mother. I couldn't turn to my friends. I had to turn to God. And I remember in that moment where God, the reality of who God was, was so real where he became dad and he became mom and he became brother and sister and he became a friend that I have never ever ever felt before and to know that a, a God like that came down for me to to love me and to show me that child it is I that has called you it is I that has has called you and told you I want you to do this this is your plan and this is your purpose in life this is where I'm calling you and 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 feeling just the the utter peace of God. And now you ask anybody, uh, uh, I'm so ready to go back to Guatemala or wherever God calls me. And I remember leaving Guatemala months and months later uh, and, and knowing, oh, my God, I'm leaving. I don't want to leave, you know. And, and it's amazing to see when God writes your own story or, or writes your story for you, it might be ups and downs and ups and downs, but God never, ever, ever leaves you. And um, I'm reminded of an old, old uh, Kirk Franklin song, um, where uh, the lines is, uh, so when you're testing trials, they seem to get you down, and all your friends and loved ones are nowhere to be found. Remember, there is a friend in Jesus who will wipe your tears away, and if your heart is broken, just lift your hands and say, I know that I can make it. I know that I can stand. No matter what may come my way, my life is in your hands. With Jesus, I can take it. With him, I know I can stand. No matter what may come my way, my life is in your hands. And, 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 and those words kept resonating in my head and in my heart. And it's one of those songs where I can honestly just, you know, hear it uh, when I'm driving and I have my Pandora and that song comes on. It's my jam. Like, I love that song. That's one of my favorite songs. And I will just start worshiping in my car because I know from personally what it's like when all your friends and loved ones are nowhere to be found. I know what, that, what that's like. In that moment, sitting in that room in Guatemala, I know what that was like. When, when, when I felt like I just wanted to go home, when I, when, when, you know, and it was, it was a personal struggle that I was facing, knowing that, you know, it, it was months, the, the, the finish line of, my, of this mission trip was so far ahead that I couldn't see the end from the beginning, but I knew that God started my beginning. I knew that God started my beginning, and because he started my beginning, I know he was going to be with me to the end. And so oftentimes we may say, you know, the words are with Jesus, I can take it. With him I know I can stand. I think sometimes we think with Jesus I can fake it, right? We, 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 we stand with God and we say in church, yes, everything is great, everything is dandy, but, but in reality it's, it's, all right, God, you know, in church, you know, you, you, you know, I say this, but in reality my life is a hot mess, right? My my struggles are real. My the situation I'm in is is so real. And and I, how do I how do I how do I move forward, God? How do I you you know you know what's what's going on. And in those moments, we, we can sing that song, right? We can we can we can look at God and say, you know, with you, Lord, I can stand. With you, Lord, anything is possible. With you, Lord, when no matter what may come my way, my life, Lord, is in your hands. No matter what may come my way, Lord, my life is in your hands. And that's, that needs to be a constant reminder. No matter how low we get in our lives, no matter what happens in our lives, God always is with you. We need to stop coming to church and faking it. We need to stop coming and, and, and talking to people and faking it. But we need to come before God and say, Lord, here I am. This is my situation. This is what's going on. This is this is. This is what I'm facing. Now, when Saul became the king of Israel, he was made king because the Israelites wanted a king. And that pretty much demanded that, uh, they, they demanded this king, Saul. But when, and God listened to him. But when David was anointed as king, I think, it's, I think it's interesting that David had seven brothers. I love reading the Bible and seeing things in there that, just pop out. And I love numbers in the Bible. I love uh, meanings of words in the Bible. Uh, I love, you know, looking at it and being like, whoa, like just to see God 
reveal themselves through scripture and not just the ordinary in the ordinary way and and like I said David was anointed as king but when he was anointed as king he had seven brothers and uh and all seven went before uh Samuel and all seven were rejected and I think it would have been cool if David was the seventh because seven is perfection and seven is whole and you know like you know David was the the one to complete the whole thing but David was number eight right and and so that throws a little, you know, to that concept that, that doesn't make sense. But I looked at what the significance of eight was. And the number eight signifies the entrance into the covenant of God. And Saul may have been the people's choice, and the seven sons may have been the most obvious of choices, but David was God's only choice, and he was the one who he wanted covenant with. And he was the one whom the covenant that he made with Abraham was going to be fulfilled. Now Saul was not the greatest of kings, and David was one of the greatest kings, but there was one who was even greater than he, and his name is Jesus. David came from Bethlehem. Jesus also came from Bethlehem. David was the unlikely one that nobody thought would be king. Jesus was also the unlikely one that nobody thought would be king. David came into the room to be anointed in, a dirty, in dirty clothes that smelled like animals, Jesus came into this world swaddled in a manger, smelling like animals. David became king at the age of 30. Jesus started his ministry on the earth at the age of 30. David ruled Judah for seven years, and then he ruled all over Israel for 33 years. Jesus walked on this earth for 33 years. The difference is David the king died, but Jesus the king of all kings lives today. And his kingdom will never, ever die. The struggle he faced on earth was greater than any other struggle that any of us will ever, ever have to face. And as I close, um, uh, I guess I can invite the worship team. Um, I, I, this concept of, of an anchor has been pressing my heart. And for some reason, I've been obsessed with anchors lately. And this, and this idea of what an anchor is and... Um, and an anchor is a device normally made of metal used to connect a vessel to the bed of a body of water. And a, an anchor needs to hold the vessel in all weathers, including the most severe storm. And uh, as I was, for some reason, like I said, there was just this, this concept of uh, an anchor kept pressing my mind and my heart and just, I don't know, this was just, I just started looking at photos of, of anchors and started looking at like if, if maybe if I got a painting with an anchor on it and and so the Lord uh, brought me to uh, Hebrews 6 verse 19 and I'm actually going to read it in the NIV version um, and 6 verse 19 it says we have this hope as an anchor for the soul firm and secure it enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain but what is this hope that it talks about it says, when God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received that was, that was promised. People swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner Jesus has entered on behalf, he has become the high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So what does that mean? Pretty much means if God told you something, he's going to do it. God cannot lie. And that is the anchor that we have, knowing that God, if God said it, that is the foundation. And it doesn't say that you may not be swayed in the storm. And it doesn't say that you won't go through the storm. But it says when you go through that storm, that no matter what comes your way, your life is in his hands. May God bless you.